Welcome everyone to uh, our webinar series on building capacity for resilience-based management. We're thrilled that you are joining us. Um, this series is delivered by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation's Resilient Reefs Initiative in partnership with um, our partner, the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network. Um, uh, my name is Amy Armstrong. I'm the Director of Resilient Reefs, and I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the initiative and the webinar series, and then turn it over to um, our speaker for today. The Resilient Reefs Initiative is um, a global effort to support coral reefs and the communities that depend on them to adapt to climate change um, and other local pressures. We're currently working with five World Heritage listed sites um, around the world, bringing together local partners and global resilience experts um, to identify new solutions um, to building the resilience. We provide a variety of support to sites, including uh, creation and funding for a new leadership role, a chief resilience officer. Um, there's a couple chief resilience officers on the webinar today. Um, we provide technical support and capacity building in the development of a holistic resilience strategy that looks at threats to both the community and uh, ecosystem. We have an amazing uh, set of partners and a global knowledge network and connect um, our reef sites to those experts. Um, and we, very importantly, have um, $5 million set aside to support our sites in implementation. So as soon as those holistic resilience strategies are done, um, we move um, into implementation and, and partner on on-ground action. We're piloting this work in five UNESCO sites, uh, the Great Barrier Reef and Ningaloo Coast, um, both in Australia, the Lagoons of New Caledonia, um, Belize's uh, Mesoamerican Reef and the Rock Island Southern Lagoon in Palau. Our effort really is about leveraging global partnerships for local impact um, and so we have an amazing array of partners that you'll see on the slide. Um, the program is uh, funded by the BHP Foundation and delivered in partnership with UNESCO, the Nature Conservancy, um, Columbia University Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes, Resilient Cities Catalyst, and AECOM. The webinar series came out of a desire from our five reef sites um, to be in better contact, um, to share best practices, um, to ask each other questions, um, and to, to leverage the network's expertise. Um, we are putting together a series of topics that we think help support um, CROs understand and build resilience-based management, um, and so it has taken a variety of, of different um, angles. Um, with that, I'm happy to turn it over to um, our guest speaker for today. Thank you so much. My name is Cedric Robillo. I'm the project director for ERIFs, working for the Great Barrier Foundation. Today I'll be talking about the ERIFs, which is an operational system we use to monitor and report and model water quality on the, on the GBR, among other things. So today I'll be talking about um, the concept and the purpose of ERIFs and its history as a project and how we managed our relationships to investors and core users. I'll provide an overview of ERIFs, which is quite a complex project, so I'll try and go through the various elements that make this um, operational system. And I'll talk a bit more about the applications and what we've learned over the years. So ERIFs was um, essentially came from the idea that, as we all know, there are multiple stresses and multiple pressures on the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon and the, the coral reefs. And to deal with this complex set of drivers, there was a need to look at models that could integrate um, various sources of information and bring that together to support decision making and management. In addition, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is a, is a system with, like many other systems around the world that are really sparsely observed, despite the fact that we have satellites um, passing over the GBR every day, and despite the fact that most of the maps show a lot of sites where we're monitoring, the scale of the Great Barrier Reef, it's, it's really minimal. There are many more areas that we don't know anything about, and it's, it's really hard to know in such a dynamic system what the condition of the system is at any point in time in all these locations. The vision of ERIFS was to cover the entire GBR as one system, and essentially to link the work that was done on land in the catchments to the outcomes in the ocean, essentially trying to understand how the river systems were connected to the GBR 
and uh, use that to try and understand the present conditions as well as understanding past conditions on the GBR and model the future and trying to predict under different scenarios what might happen with the Great Barrier Reef. As a model, it's also providing interactive access to a, a whole range of data and reports that uh, we've been developing over the years. It's been a collaboration. It's a research project, essentially, um, between a number of partners, um, CSRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, the Australian Institute of Marine Science, Queensland Government and the Great Barrier Foundation. And it's been funded over the years by a combination of uh, industry, BHP Billiton, uh, CSRO through the Science Industry Endowment Fund, Queensland Government, Australian Government, with collaborations from uh, the, integrated Marine, Mar oh, sorry, the Integrated Marine Observing System, IMOS. All in all, the whole project um, ended up uh, costing about 36 million Australian dollars. Um, and as you can see here, that was over quite a long period. And the concept and the pilot were um, started in 2010 based on um, a gap analysis that was conducted in 2008 that showed that there would be great value in designing a system of this kind. And the pilot was run essentially using Google Earth to show what the potential could be in terms of visualization and connection of these various models from land to ocean. In um, 2011, the project started in earnest, and that was the first phase, which was really about demonstrating the potential and conducting the very early R&D to prove that, that this could be assembled as a system, which ultimately led to a second phase of investment between 2014 and 17. At that point, the services were well understood and were started to become embedded uh, in the various um, agencies. And from 2018 to 2020, we've essentially operationalized this system has embedded the system even more trying to understand exactly what the long-term maintenance and, and management of this system might be and right now um, when i record this presentation is june 2020 and we are looking at the next four years of investment in this system to continue delivering uh, the essential services that it provides and we'll discuss later as well as looking at strategy strategies for continuous improvement so that we can stay on par with all the technological developments that are happening all the time. As a research program, it was governed by a project board um, and underneath an operations committee and essentially um, an independent project director myself and a series of research directors from each of the institutions uh, overseeing streams of work within each institution and collaboratively across the institutions. The key difference with IRIFs very early on is that a, a, a user reference group was set up to really allow us to connect the work we were doing with the needs of the stakeholders and users. In this case, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, the state and Australian governments, tourism industry, even the Royal Australian Navy. So strong connections to users. As a system, this is probably the the simplest summary of IRIFs, there's a, there is a series of research components that underpin a whole um, suite of data products that are accessible as such as data products, but also as um, it can be processed further into uh, visualization services um, and in, in user um, in user based systems. So uh, different applications um, that we'll discuss later. Um, what we refer to in, in, to in this box called ocean color is essentially the use of satellite information to infer optical properties of the GBR lagoon. So we use satellites um, that are international and we've developed um, a whole series of, of algorithms and systems and machine learning strategies to be able to um, infer from the signal of these satellites the optical properties um, of the GBR lagoon. That was used to look at temperature, um, to predict the risk of bleaching, as well as looking at uh, some particular properties of the water, whether chlorophyll or suspended sediments. So it's essentially the, the first time that we had access for such a um, large geographical scale, uh, large spatial scale, that we had access to detailed information about the, the components in the water. 
the original models um, is really the core of ERIFS and probably the biggest um, R&D element of the project. And it's essentially based on this concept that um, if we can design a hydrodynamic model, flow model in the Great Barrier Reef and couple to this uh, water transport model, uh, some sediment transport and some water quality model, which we refer to as biogeochemistry model, then we're essentially able to, in real time, understand the condition through this three-dimensional environment that is the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. Ultimately, this could potentially be used when coupled with habitat maps um, and a better understanding of the ecology. We could ultimately link that to an ecological model, but that's not the case within ERIFS. It's still some, some, uh, quite a, some way away from being able to do that. So the interesting aspect about the, the water quality models that were developed within ERIFS is that uh, we were able to use the optical properties of the components of the water. Um, various elements in the water actually uh, will absorb different wavelengths. And using that, we're able to recreate essentially a color image of the GBR. The reason it's important is because the, the actual color, what we refer to as true color of the surface of the water and of the water on the GBR, carries a lot of information. We're able to look at where the plumes are from the river, whether it's mostly driven by chlorophyll, or whether it's mostly driven by suspended sediments, whether there's organic matter. All, this, all of these things can be inferred from, from the images. And the value of doing that as well is, as an output of our model, these true color images can be compared to the satellite data, which I showed you before. So if we can generate uh, quality products from the satellite information, and compare that to our models, we're able to ground truth essentially our model. So what you can see here um, on the left-hand side is an image from the satellite. The white areas are either land on the left or the clouds. And that's one of the limitations of the satellites is that when you've got clouds, then you don't get any data. On the right-hand side is the um, prediction of our um, uh, water quality model. And what you can see, and we're able to match that. And of course, there's no cloud in our model since we simply predicted the, the color of the water based on its optical properties. So we are able to line these two images. And when you combine these two, it's essentially you're able to, to grant truth your model and get much better results. The value of that as an example here is when you have a big event and you want to understand how your system responded to that. But quite often on the Great Barrier Reef, when there are high energy events like Cyclone, for example, here Cyclone Debbie, then you have very intense cloud cover, at least in initial stages, which means you actually can't see through this and you can't understand the system. We use our models to be able to understand what's happening behind these clouds. And that allows us to have a much better understanding of the response of the system in various locations and at different resolutions. So to help um, grant truth, I guess, and validate our models, we use a whole range of observations. Um, all the observations that are available on the GBR on a regular basis, we integrate it into our model to conduct what we call skill assessment, essentially comparing the model results to uh, what, the, what the measurements are. The challenge here, though, is that the data we get from the models is extremely rich as opposed to a simple mooring or a simple water sample. We look at three-dimensional modeling of the entire lagoon. So we use more complex systems to gather information. For example, these gliders that are essentially um, remotely controlled and go up and down and are able to measure a whole range of properties of the water. What that gives us over a transect or over, a, I guess, a path we can get this profiling of the water, which we are then able to compare to our model, which is also uh, three-dimensional. And we essentially end up with, with curves like that, where the model predicts in real time what is um, happening, and we compare over time what, what the, the measurements gave us, and we can see whether our models accord well with, uh, with the data, or whether it's actually, it actually needs to be better calibrated and better understood. 
all that to say that models are extremely dependent on observations. When people say, oh, we don't need to monitor anymore because the models can do that for us. Actually, no, the more models and the more complex the models, the more observations you need, at least in initial stages, to be able to, to calibrate your model. Now, um, this next item is about uh, relocatable coastal models. And um, these models are essentially a higher resolution version of what I've described before. So the broader model gives us, um, I guess, the information that we call the boundary around an area, uh, a geographical area. And we can, within that model data, embed a much finer grid, uh, which allows us to then get uh, get very high resolution information. So what you see here, the little arrows around the islands are essentially a 200 meter resolution, whereas the model around it is, is one kilometer grid, actually giving us access to much uh, higher value information. Uh, one component of ERIPS is also the modeling of catchment uh, flow and using that to forecast the river flows and understand how they might impact the marine environment. And the Bureau of Meteorology conducted this, and essentially, it's linking your rainfall predictions to um, your river flow models to understand what might be the flow through these rivers in a, in one, two, three, or four days. Why that's important is that they can now they can then be connected to your marine model to predict what might be the behavior of your coastal system over the next few days. So if you know there's a big event coming, then you're able to potentially predict where you should be putting your monitoring stations to try and see some impacts. The examples were, were Cyclone Debbie, where the Bureau of Meteorology was able to couple the forecast of their river models using the rainfall forecast and couple that to the marine models, which um, could forecast the current and the movement of water uh, two or three days ahead, therefore being able to understand where the plume would be. So that river started to flow into the system and uh, essentially three days ahead, we were able to um, replicate what happened in the system. So it was a very interesting case of being able to predict the behavior of a, of a coastal response to a big natural event. Some of the applications that we use the Earth system for, um, here is a simulation of one river in 2011 doing a high rainfall event. It's the Burdekin River. The beauty of this system is that uh, contrary to observations, here you can turn, you can decide to only keep one river on and turn all the other rivers off. What it gives you is the ability to understand the specific impact um, caused by this river and therefore to start understanding the risk associated with all of these rivers. So here we had simply turned off all the other rivers in the system and focused entirely on what would come out of these rivers, this particular river under these conditions. And we were able to show that the, the impact of that river extended well beyond the coastal area in front of that river. And in fact, with the current in the GBR, moved up north and had a very significant impact uh, much, north, much more uh, north of the, of the river than we expected. Similarly, we can use these models to compare conditions that have not been experienced. We can look, for example, as what was modeled um, in the catchment on land before European settlement and try and see, uh, based on today's conditions that are also modeled in the catchment, what the difference is. So essentially, we can say that if you were to uh, turn off all the human activities in the catchment, this is um, these are the differences you might observe in terms of nutrients, in terms of chlorophyll A, in terms of suspended solids. What this allows you to do is to, to run this for very different sets of conditions and try to understand the impact of your investment. So as the government and other um, stakeholders invest in the catchment to try and reduce, for example, the, the amount of fertilizers, this allows you to understand if you were to do that in these catchments, what would actually be the impact um, in the marine environment in, in these conditions? And the importance of that is you can link your investment to actual impact and benefits uh, for the, the reef health. Another range of applications, as I mentioned before, the system is very sparsely observed 
and it's a very dynamic system. So what's happening in one location at one point in time um, is not really correlated to what's happening 50 kilometers away. What that means is that measuring the condition of the system, for example, um, water salinity or water temperature, if you measure that in one point on the GPR, that doesn't give you a lot of information spatially around that. And so you end up with, of course, many locations when you're monitoring, but they don't give you much information at all in the blanks, in all these areas that are in between all these monitoring locations. So with the models, we can use all the value of these monitoring observations as well as the satellite information to integrate all that into, um, I guess, the most probable um, water quality conditions that are actually observed across the entire system. <coughs> Sorry. And from that, we're able to then um, generate aggregates and average over various uh, spatial areas. And from that, we are able to link that to indicators of water quality and water condition. So here, for example, we, we're supporting the reporting within report card, reef report card, and we're providing, providing the marine water quality components since 2016 17. That's an example of the report card. What we can also do with the high resolution model is focused on a, focus on a whole range of reefs. So if you imagine that you take all these individual reefs and you start modeling those at a much higher resolution and, and in very fine time scale, you're able to understand how the system operates across all of these reefs. So here, for example, we're looking for all of those at their um, ability to, to, ex to retain water, essentially measuring the residence time of the water. Why that's important is because when we start looking at um, actual interventions on this reef to try and cool them down, for example, then it's really important to understand um, the movement and the flow of water on these reefs. That gives you a much better understanding of your chances of success if you were to try various interventions to cool this water down. So that's one example of an application that we're currently um, working on. Similarly, you can also do a much more, I would say, macro analysis and try to look over a number of years, um, look at some very broad indicators of resilience for your reef. So here, for example, um, this study looked at combining various drivers and various pressures. So good management of cranial fund starfish with good water quality versus you know, um, not as optimal management of cranial fund starfish. And, potentially a poorer water quality using earrings. And what you get there is, is an understanding when you couple that to um, finer scale ecological models of growth of your coral and the behavior of your reefs, then you're able to look at what are the indicators of coral cover, for example, or, or over these different scenarios. And you're able to say, well, under this climate change scenario, for example, with this water quality, conditions, then that's what I'm expecting to see in terms of um, future coral cover on these key reefs. But if I uh, look at a scenario where um, global warming is much more intense, then you're able to assess the impact here and understand whether water quality actually improvements would make a difference, uh, if at all, in these conditions. Um, so this is a conceptual model of what would be, I guess, the ideal application for us. Because the models are integrators of information, that's where the real value is. So at the moment, Australia is investing a lot in developing um, much finer and much higher resolution and much more current habitat maps. So if the GBR is well mapped, well mapped from a habitat point of view, and if in parallel, we are able to generate the scientific um, knowledge about how various drivers and pressures impact um, these habitats. Then using ERIPS, we're essentially able to say, to, to link the habitat maps into the three-dimensional modeling of these conditions and understand the impact. So let's say, for example, if, if we understand the impact of temperature combined with salinity and um, suspended solid on a particular habitat, then we're able to bring all that information together across a long time scale using areas to understand the, the pressure response uh, 
map of this system. So um, if high turbidity links to water, low water clarity and temperature and salinity have an impact on seagrass, for example, if we know where seagrass is and we map that and we link that to the IRIFS data, then we're potentially able to understand the risk that is faced by these various seagrass habitats uh, over time and under different conditions. So it's essentially the holy grail of being able to link the ecosystem drivers to the response. And we've done that for coral bleaching, for example, which is um, not simply a response to temperature, obviously. Um, there's, um, we've shown in the past that there was an impact of nutrients and light, as well as temperature on the, on the symbiont. And that's why it's causes, that's what causes the um, oxidative stress and the release and expulsion of this uh, symbiont from, from the host. So this, um, this understanding of the scientific model can then be embedded into our area system where we monitor, where we are able to model temperature, um, light and depth, and we're also able to, to model the nutrient level in the water. So when we combine all that, we're able to generate bleaching risk maps that are much more um, sophisticated than simply basing this on, on a temperature indicator measured at the surface. Finally, um, IRIFS also allows you to do a whole lot of things related to education because the volume of data and the quality of the data is, is very high. You get um, data every 10 minutes, every hour, and you're able to look at particular events and represent that in a way that communicates a lot of information. So for example, here we are able to uh, pre-generate all these video animations that are freely available on our website, which allow you to look at, uh, for example, temperature in response to to the wind in the system and, and look also at salinity to understand the, the rainfall. So when you have a cyclonic event, like the one I'm going to show here, um, cyclone is going through the system, then you see the water cooling um, on the temperature side following the passage of the cyclone, which essentially stirred all this water. But then you start seeing post the cyclone, you start seeing an increase in rainfall in the system, which has an impact on the coast. So that's the value of, of this type of product to generate some really interesting uh, visualization products. Anyway, all this to say that um, obviously it's a very large project and I would encourage you to go and look at our websites. But the lessons we've learned in terms of this program is that sometimes you have to you have to be bold. The initial pilot was very ambitious and the project has grown from there into, into a very impressive suite of, of uh, environmental uh, modeling systems. But you need to bring your users along on a journey. You, you have to constantly um, avoid the, the pitfall of um, just focusing on your technology. You need to understand why you're doing it and where is the best value for your products and align your research to that. Part of that is obviously about translating the science, especially in these systems that these models are extremely complex. So how do we convey the information about what matters and what doesn't? And that requires a constant effort of translation, translation constantly. But models in themselves are, are great integrators because they're able, as I showed just before, to bring a whole lot of information together to help understand some very complex problems and some very complex systems in a way that people can relate to. And that can help focus the engagement as well in the research. Yet, it's really important that when we do that, we create some safe space for our scientists. Um, within IRIS, we've been able to, to, I guess, manage the balance of interaction with users and responding to, to demand, um, while at the same time letting um, our scientists be creative and try new things. And it, it's been really um, enriching and productive at the same time. And look, strong governance, strong principles, extremely important and this notion of respect between uh, the users, decision makers and investors and the scientists is extremely important and that goes um, both ways. So it's been a really rewarding experience. In terms of acknowledgements, this is a list of people from the various institutions but look it's, it's nowhere near the complete uh, picture. So obviously you've seen it's, a, it's been a long um, road, a long journey and with many people involved. Uh, so please just have a look at the literature. There's, there are plenty of papers related to this. Um, but
but essentially that's a short list. And thank you, thank you very much. These are my uh, details, as well as the details of the various websites where the RIPS products are presented. Please get in touch with us, and we're very happy to guide you to the right places and to help you find your way through all this. There's a lot of information, and uh, our scientists are always happy to help to prove, try and see whether there are some data sets that could be of particular use, or whether there are some methods that could be uh, applied or learned from for your particular project. So, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.